Okay. Thanks everyone for joining us today. We're excited to have you here for the final day of Spring Bloom 2021. For those who have attended a Spring Bloom in the past, welcome back. We're glad to have you here, even if it's just virtually. For those of you who are new, welcome. Normally, Spring Bloom is an in-person event at the SAWS headquarters building off 281 in Mulberry, but this year we're excited to bring it to you virtually. Spring Bloom is our spring gardening kickoff event where we invite our community to start planning their yards for the coming warmer weather. And after the recent freeze across Texas, there's no better time to have warmer weather and a garden. If you attended our Wednesday webinar, you heard about how to maximize SAWS incentives to transform your landscape. Today, we have two SAWS conservation team members here to talk about how to remove grass and establish beds, two essential parts of transforming your landscape. Mark Peterson is a project coordinator in our department. You may have heard him on a local radio gardening show. And Gail Gallegos is one of our fantastic irrigation consultants. You may have seen her driving around town in one of our SAWS garden style trucks and doing irrigation consultations in your neighborhood. We also have Seth Patterson, another one of our fantastic irrigation consultants, who's here with us to host and help with questions. So with that, Mark and Gail, take it away. Good morning. Thank you very much. Morning, morning, Gail. Morning, Martha. Morning, Seth. Thank you very, very much. Uh, as uh, Martha had mentioned, uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box and we'll be answering them at the end. Topics for today's webinar. As I finally called this, uh, removing grass for coupons and for pleasure. Uh, that's right, we'll talk a little bit about how we're going to get rid of grass. So, removing grass, planting wisely, and then maintaining wisely. A little administrative uh, uh, cleaning. Remember, if you are a rewards member, you can earn a point today. So to become a rewards member, sign up at GardenStyleSA.com. So let's begin, shall we? Uh, why do we want to remove the lawns? Well, lawns are considered to be the highest users of water in the landscape. Sometimes as much as 75% of, of your summer monthly bill. And that is a lot of water. Uh, four species are considered turf, St. Augustine, Zoysia, Bermuda, and what we call a mixed native bunch. Now, you may know this uh, as habit turf or thunder turf. Uh, so that's uh, uh, another variety of grasses. Uh, frequently, I receive phone calls saying which species uses more water. Well, Technically, they all use the same amount of water if you want them to be green year round. For example, if you want Bermuda to be green in uh, August, you're going to use approximately the same amount of water as a as St. Augustine, which is considered the highest use. Or highest user. Today, Mark, we're going to. Yes, ma'am. I'm jumping in because I want to yes. say besides saving on water, sometimes you just want a more beautiful, diverse landscape like what you see behind Mark. And sometimes that's just the, the reason. Yes, benefit, you get to save water and save money, but sometimes you just want to have that gorgeous blooming yard that attracts all kinds of pollinators. Oh, save that thought, because I'm going to get back to you on that and a little bit later on another slide. All right, so uh, basically we want to talk about uh, three methods today. Chemical, covering, which includes solarization, if you hadn't had that term, Gail's going to explain that. Digging it out, physically digging it. Uh, and all these are covered in a great article written by Gail uh, on our garden style essay.com, sanantonio.com, where we archive all the articles that we have. And just a brief note, uh, if you haven't signed up for our weekly newsletter, please do, because uh, it comes out on Wednesday and it is full of all kinds of design, plant, and maintenance information. So go to the website, gardenstylesantonio.com, and look on uh, articles. I just want to say that because I, Gail, Gail and I do a lot of the writing on that, so I just want to promote that. So briefly, a uh, chemical. What is chemical? I have some lovely slides here, but what is it? It's applying a chemical 
that kills not only the leaf blade, but hopefully also the root as well. So it's a good, clean kill. Now, there's been a lot of discussion in the media uh, about organic versus inorganic. Uh, that could take us the whole morning. We're going to stay out of that debate. But we do highly recommend an organic uh, product, uh, which is a mixture of two ounces of orange oil, one gallon of 18% or stronger vinegar, and one ounce of dish soap. Now, uh, internally, we like to use the blue Dawn, but that's okay. You can use anything you want. Uh, that is a very good organic mixture that will kill grass and uh, other weeds. Excuse me. Um, now, we recommend any kind of chemical, whichever chemical you use, that you're going to at least apply it twice get good kill and that is seven to 14 days according to label recommendations pros it's easy to use easy to mix up it's very time and labor efficient as an excellent kill when applied appropriately uh, the cons on the other hand it's very significant there's a lot of research going on that shows the harmful effects of certain chemicals on uh, the environment and particularly non-target wildlife and plant species. So you gotta be careful on that. So that's the pros and the cons. I'm gonna let Gail talk about covering and her favorite digging here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so covering can be a variety of materials, but it's basically you're covering the area that currently has grass and it could be with, as you see in this picture, newspaper or cardboard. And you, you'll probably want to lay rocks on that, you know, so that it doesn't blow away or anything else. Now, what it's doing is basically it's smothering the grass. And in our area, it's also beneficial when you've got heat going on. So it's smothering and cooking the grass. Um, when you have newspaper like this, it's important to not use the slick uh, advertising ones. Just use the regular newspaper that doesn't have any gloss to it. And then when you're using cardboard like this, some cardboard, all cardboard is not created equal. So if you've got some flimsier, lighter cardboard, you might want to do a couple layers. And when you've got some good heavy cardboard, that's probably one layer is good enough. And the same thing for the newspaper. Just make it enough to where you, you're looking at it, you think, oh, that's about a layer of cardboard worth of newspaper. And put some rocks on top. And so go to the next slide, please, Mark. So this is the other method of covering, and it's also called solarization. It's where you put plastic over. Now, it's really important to use a clear plastic as opposed to a black plastic. Black plastic, if, if, if it, all of us know who lived in the heat, black is gonna kind of reflect to heat, and the clear plastic is gonna let that sun go through and do a better kill. Again, you're going to need to probably put something on it. As you see in the photos, they've got different materials laying on top of it so it so that it holds it down in place. You really want to put a, a contact with whatever you're putting down, whether it's newspaper, cardboard, or plastic, have it have contact with the grass. And different methods are going to take a different time period. The plastic is probably going to take about six weeks. Again, it's all kind of weather dependent. How hot is it getting? And the cardboard and the newspaper are going to could take up to six months, again, depending on how much heat we're getting and how thick and uh, happy your grass was before that. So as I said, it's basically laying down paper or cardboard to smother and cook the grass. <clears throat> the pros to it is that it doesn't use chemicals. That's a huge pro. Um, I'm just not a fan of whether it's strapping it to my back or putting it in my yard. I kind of rather avoid those two. So it's, a, it's easy to do. It's not labor intensive. Um, and because you're you're killing the grass right there and you're not going to go rake the grass off afterwards you're adding nutrients and carbon to the soil so you're improving the soil that you're going to plant in later the cons is it says it's labor intensive it's not i mean compared to digging it's not that labor intensive you're laying down cardboard i guess it's all relative 
and you can have mixed results because if you if you don't have good solid contact with that grass and you don't leave it on long enough you might not kill those roots and as we all know roots are the actual life of the grass so you can kill the blades but you've got to kill those rhizomes in order to to make it a true death um, and it says it reduces oxygen increases soil moisture uh, depending on where you're living i think we all want to increase soil moisture in, in our area anyway so but yep that's covering now like he said this is my favorite <laughs> so I, I i really do like this method um it's instant gratification whether or not you rent this piece of machine and you cut underneath the the soil and the roots and you're lifting it out boom you've got it right there they're gone um, that's instant gratification now if you've got bermuda and they have those deeper roots, then yeah, I'm gonna suggest you actually get some kind of machine. There's also you know, physical tilling and digging up of Bermuda, but it's a lot harder with those deep roots. And if you have St. Augustine or Zoysia, it's a lot easier to kind of pull those shorter roots out. Um, and that's where I like, because I have a small yard that has St. Augustine. And if I ever want a cathartic, stress releasing experience i go out and i dig up some grass and again i turn around i look the grass is gone with any mechanism you're going to have some grass coming back so whether you dig it out by hand dig it out by machine cover it up or even use the chemical you're probably going to have to go back and and find some little ones that have made it and just pull them out but that's a maintenance topic that we'll get to later So this is the slide on digging. So basically, we also want you to go to gardenstyle.com because we have a lot of articles. My article, you know, there's more than one way to remove grass, has links to all the different um, types of removal. So you can find out more from, from that one article. It will take you to all the different ones. The pros on this one, like I said, it's, it's a good kill, usually high um, death rate while removing it it get the roots which is where the life is and it's a stress reliever you get that little physical workout you're making contact with you know your grass and just getting it out and it's just it's awesome the cons is it does it's a little labor intensive but like i said you get a good workout and on thin rocky soils this is the hard part you can't use that machine if you've got a real sloped yard so and sometimes with rocks and everything it's really hard to get those roots out so take a look at your area how big is it what is the rock how thin is the soil etc and kind of just go over different which ones would be best for you all right i'm going to uh, talk about uh, these plantings if i can there i go uh so now that you've killed it mark mark pull your fix your microphone because we're not hearing you mark we can't hear you we're not hearing you i think his headphones died oh no Okay, so I'll talk about this. So now that you've killed it, what do you do? You don't really wanna till because tilling up the soil with shovels and spades, forks, machines, it's all this, it really does encourage the weeds. And the other thing is that research is now telling us that it disrupts the soil fungi, the microorganisms and the nutrient. So if you think about all the different little organisms that are in the soil that are helping the plants, they're, they're connecting with the root and they're getting them more nutrients. Well, when you till, you're killing a great number of them. So don't till and don't take away your grass, okay? So what you want to do is leave the dead grass in place so that's going to help put some nutrients into the soil and it also is going to make a nice little cover so that you can you know have a little bit it's like a little bit of mulch but you're going to add more mulch but leave the grass as part of the mulch okay my microphone my, my thing off so so hi, I, I i'm back uh so, 
Mark, Gail covered this slide while you're muted, yep. but let's There you go. Yeah, so you. I would love to have her also cover this slide then. Okay. As well. All right. I'm sorry. I was typing an answer. Okay. So again, now that you killed it, what what are you going to do with that little blank spot right there? Well, think about this. You've got rid of that water hogging grass for a reason. So let's put in something that's not going to take as much uh, uh, water and it's going to survive our hot, hot summers. Now, we used to say and our mild winters, but we have all been through something different this year. So let's try and think about things that when you look into your neighbor's yards or in the botanical gardens, what survived well, okay? So if it made it through that cold, cold uh, winter, you know, it's probably gonna take our, our hot summer as well. But get one of our Garden Style 100 Best Plant Water Saver magazines or go to gardenstyle.com and start looking for what kind of area is your empty spot in? Is it shade, all sun, part shade? And match up the plants that will, you know, do well in that area. You also have to think about, you know, what part of Bear County you're in because every part of Bear County seems to have a very different soil makeup. So, you know, try to get it to fit, you know, the area that you have. But drought tolerant, native, nearly native, neighborly native, those are the ones that are going to do best around here. Right after you plant your beautiful new plants, make sure you give it a thorough watering. And what you're doing is you're kind of like getting all the air pockets from when you planted it out so that it, all the roots are around soil instead of having air because air is kind of the enemy of roots. And then these are going to be drought tolerant eventually. But while they're getting transitioned and established, you're probably going to need to give them a little bit more water until they're really making it on their own. After that, you're going to have a beautiful, beautiful garden instead of grass. That was well put. I was I was enamored by it. I just loved it. Uh, yeah, many of you heard that I encourage air, but I'm not talking about air pockets around the soil. That's why we water. Anytime you plant, you fill the soil halfway up the hole and water it in to get rid of those pockets. And then once you fill in all the soil, you water it one more time to do that. All right, just briefly, the maintenance for newly planted beds. What's, what are you gonna do in those uh, first couple of years? And at this point, I want to encourage everyone to listen in and to the webinar at 11 o'clock, where we talk about what to do for those toddler years, those years after you plant. That will be hosted by Karen Guz and Nathan Rakes. Uh, and it will be a great program. So that's at 11 o'clock. Be sure you join in. Uh, planting, uh, you can still use chemical herbicides and use only as necessary, but we highly encourage you to use a wick or a paintbrush. I went through and, and found a, uh, a paintbrush that you know reminded me of my kindergarten years using a paintbrush. And you just use that and apply that directly to the weed. Or what we recommend is using combinations of compost and mulch. And if you do that on a regular basis, you'll be able to uh, easily pull out those, uh, those weeds, but also they will diminish those seeds from actually germinating. And so you will have less weeds to use and uh, they will also come out much easier. I have one slide to put in that the, uh, the rest of the crew has a seed I put in this morning. It's one of my famous slides, stop the grass madness. Uh, tree roots underneath grass, tree roots underneath two and a half inches of mulch. Uh, yes, this is another reason why, as we mentioned earlier, uh, not only for water use and water reduction, but also for the health of other existing plants and putting in the new pollinators that Gail so lovely, lovingly talked about that we want to really encourage for our bees, birds, and butterfly friends. Well, just want to say, first of all, remember to become a rewards member. And also then at the end of this program, we'll have a survey 
that will uh, you will be eligible to complete for spring bloom, spring bloom points and prizes. So please do that. At this time, well, if you have any other questions, um, submit them to Garden Geek. But at this time, we'd like to answer some of those questions that you may have submitted. So, Martha, do we have any questions? Yeah, I'm going to actually let Seth hand, ask the questions, but we want to get to one first that's come in, and we we've, we've put the answer in the Q and A for those who wanted the chemical mix. But Mark, can you repeat the chemical mix one more yes. time? And and can you tell where to get or give a hint of where to get 18 percent or higher vinegar? Yeah, so uh, that. That part uh, is is frequently asked. Uh, at first, it was orange oil. Now, most uh, hardwares and nurseries have the orange oil. Uh, the vinegar is a little harder to find, but I have been told that at some HEBs, but also at uh, nurseries and farm ranch to far, uh, uh, farm and ranch stores. Sorry, farm and ranch stores will have the 18 plus uh vinegar it usually comes in 18 percent or uh 20 percent and that's the one to use uh so for everyone's edification uh two ounces of orange oil to 18 percent or more strong vinegar that's a gallon and then one ounce or two two teaspoons of uh of uh, dish soap to go in there and that acts as a spreader, what we call a spreader sticker, to adhere the orange oil and vinegar to the leaves. And somebody asked that uh, uh, that I came in a couple of days ago. When do we do that? You, it works best on sunny mornings. Uh, that's when I think it works the best. So that's when to apply it. And as with all chemicals, apply it every seven to fourteen days. Uh, twice. All right, thank you, Mark. And also just to add to that, remember to apply on non windy days because chemical drift can definitely affect other plants as well. Um, so we do have a question here for Gail um, from Susan Sutcliffe. She was asking if you could please repeat the time to leave down cardboard, newspaper or clear plastics to kill grass. Right, so for the clear plastic, you want to leave it down for about six weeks. And also just throughout that six week period, make sure you have good contact going on, whether it's moving rocks around or adding more rocks. You want to get that real soil to plastic contact. And then for the cardboard and newspaper, it could be up to six months. It's dependent on what, what kind of weather you're having, the hotter, the better, but again, Take a look at where it may be coming up. It's getting loose. It's uh, it's a constant watching and making sure you're getting good contact. If you get a lot of rain, you may need to put some of that newspaper down again. Cardboard is a little bit hardier. Six weeks for the clear plastic, six months for the cardboard and newspaper. Thank you, Gail. And actually to follow up on that, Susan Scoggins asked, if you're using cardboard or newspaper, can you leave that down and put mulch directly on top of it as kind of a compost? Right, and what I said was, yes for the newspaper, especially if you don't use any of the kind that has the gloss to it. If it's just plain newspaper, yes. It will decompose slowly and it's fine. But the cardboard, depending on the thickness of it, I would just not recommend that because cardboard takes quite a while to decompose and break down. I would remove the, the cardboard. All right, and Mark, um, when you're doing this kind of work, laying down cardboard or plastics, can you actually hurt tree roots while you're killing the grass? Yeah, and so there's growing evidence, and I, I totally agree with Gail that uh, you use the cardboard to kill the grass, and then you may take that up. Uh, I think there's growing evidence across the country that, uh, quote, lasagna method or or just using the cardboard uh, does hurt existing plants uh, by eliminating oxygen uh, on that. So uh, yes, it works very well. Just be careful with it lingering over the time that to have it after you've killed the grass. 
Okay. And so uh, moving back to chemical control or, or removal, um, Glenn Godwin, and I'm paraphrasing here, she said, if giving in and tackling the barbar and concrete hardiness of Bermuda grass by using a non-organic chemical herbicide, such as glyphosate, after two applications, seven days apart, how should she, how long should she wait before planting again? According to the research, she can go in almost immediately. I always like to wait 72 hours, but uh, from the label, you could go in immediately after the second, uh, the second application. I wouldn't do that. I would wait at least 72 hours, three days. Okay. And if you're doing a chemical herbicide, be it organic or not, would you recommend combining uh, solarization with that? Uh, I, I wouldn't, but, uh, some other people may, and it may depend on the chemical, uh, the orange oil, uh, often kills the top part, but not necessarily the roots. So if I would use the orange oil vinegar mixture and I got a good top kill, if I wanted to be absolutely sure, then I would go with solarization as well. Yeah. Okay. Do you, do you have any other? Other ideas on that? That's that's no, my idea. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when you're using chemicals, um, are you also killing earthworms and other non-target species? That's why I like to use the orange oil and vinegar mix. Uh, there's very little uh, what we call ancillary effects on that. Um, I I I don't think there's hardly any. Uh, I may be wrong on that one, but that's the reason I like to use it. All right, uh, and back to you, Gail. Um, someone is asking here about under large oak trees, should I use mulch? I have huge root flares, but no grass grows, or I'm sorry, maybe Mark would be the one to answer this. They say so, that yes, mulch I was, I sometimes- was gonna defer that one to Mark. <laughs> <laughs> They're saying uh, that their, their concern is that sometimes yeah. mulch retains moisture and can attract um, non-beneficial yeah. or detrimental insects. Uh, for 37 years since I've lived here in San Antonio, I've had this repeated question. I have these little sprouts growing underneath my live oaks. What can I do? Uh, that's one, and we don't really have a really good solution for that other than cutting them very close, lying the laying down the landscape cloth, uh, and then putting the mulch on top, uh, or, or uh, planting some Asiac jasmine and 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 because it looks similar than just pruning as necessary. Uh, mulch in general, if you get above six inches beneath a tree, then you're starting to be detrimental. Ideally, we'd like to have two inches or less of mulch. Particularly in the Southwest, we are worried that, uh, particularly on a day like today. Uh, the rain is just watering the mulch and not the ground. So we like to, to lean towards one inch of mulch underneath. So uh, if you're using mulch for maintenance practices, one to two inches underneath the trees is appropriate. Perfect. Um, so Stefan um, Shazani's here asked, how deep must you go to remove Bermuda grass roots? So this China. is my answer to this, to China, exactly. And actually, different areas of Bear County have different amounts of soil depth, but one thing is consistent. So what I say is first test your soil depth, however deep it is, that's how deep the Bermuda roots are. But the other thing is no matter how deep or shallow or rocky, Bermuda roots are like super glue. They're just tough to get out. So whether they're, even if they're shallow, um, you're just gonna be, you're gonna have to put some muscle in there to get them out. And if they are deep, yeah, you're gonna have to, to try and like get the bulk of them. There could be that there's some residual parts of roots, but you do this, you know, and then do some maintenance and, and the Bermuda grass will eventually not come back. Anything it is the combination, yes, it's, it's the combination Thanks. of the treatment plus the maintenance on that. 
if you can keep up with your malt and uh, keep it at uh, consistently at, at appropriate depth, then that will diminish the the, uh, the the both weeds and grass. Not completely. I'm never going to get 100%, but it does help with that. And then that's where you come in, and if you do have Supreme Muna, you can attack it quickly with an appropriate chemical. Okay, so there's a question here from Christina. Um, do you, you have any garden tool recommendations besides, rent besides renting the machine to remove the grass? We love to get a little dirty and don't mind the slow manual labor. Great de-stressor. So any garden tool recommendations? So, Mark, you... I've, I've, yeah, go ahead. No, I, what I was going to say is, uh, yeah, uh, in that one picture that we showed, uh, it was kind of flat. And if you really want to get into it, you'd start with a uh, round point shovel and mm -hmm. then go to a square point shovel and just kind of scoot it along there. Um, that would be very physical manually, but uh, the best way to do, I just remembered, just the best way to do any kind of machine is make sure you moisten the night before or the exactly. day before, and it, and it works out a lot better on that. Um, and I just was just remembering that slide we put up, and that appeared to be a moistened, and so it was much easier to dig up. So that's always a little hint, moisten the day before. And that also goes with planting your bed, moisten the day before, and then after you finish planting, uh, rewet, rewater. Okay. I agree completely. Um, so going back to the tree root and um, solarization or laying down materials, someone did ask, is it okay to use the lasagna method with newspaper without harming tree roots? Yeah, and that's what I referred to, uh, and then go further into what 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 is the lasagna method? Lasagna is multiple layers of uh, either paper or more likely card cardboard. And what the research is showing across the country is that when you have that much of uh, of organic matter in the form of a paper or uh, cardboard, then that's going to diminish the oxygen to the existing roots. And so it could be detrimental. Uh, like uh, a few sheets of paper or a couple, uh, what do we call it, Gail? One, 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 one box length of cardboard. So Right, exactly. So if you're talking about your newspaper, you're just going to make it as thick as a normal piece of cardboard is. Um, yeah. Yeah, so so two to three sheets of, of newspaper uh, and one uh, width of cardboard. Uh, but the lasagna method is multiple sheets of paper and cardboard and possibly compost. And uh, really, I like to... Uh, really dissuade people from using that, particularly if they have existing plants, either shrubs or trees. Okay, great. And uh, here's another question kind of along the same lines as, as putting stuff down. This is about colored mulch specifically, and are there the dyes that are used in these mulches, are they bad for the soil? I don't know if we're going to say bad, uh, define bad. Um, they're not good. <laughs> and I wouldn't use them. Uh, I, I just like uh, natural hardwood chips uh, or pine bark chips, which is kind of uh, my favorite just because the aroma and that the fact that they don't decompose very quickly. Uh, colored chips, uh, I don't know if anyone's really done the definitive research on it. It just, I just think it, the dye is, is usually a, a hydrocarbon of some form. And that's probably not a good idea to put in our soil. So, Mark, so. when you're at a nursery, or I know it's sold at big box stores as well, mm -hmm. um, the grocery stores sell mulch. What what should people be looking for on the bag of mulch? Uh, I like chips. Uh, natural hardwood chips is usually what they have, or shredded hardwood. Uh, I, Shredded hardwood is frequently used because it doesn't float away. 
Uh, I just think shredded kind of packs down over time. So I like just the wood chips itself. Uh, but natural hardwood is usually what is on the label. Okay. And actually right along that same line of thought, someone's asking um, if you recommend mixing the the hardwood mulch um, with worm casings or using worm casings at all or when to yeah. put them down? So over the years, uh, new products have come onto the market. Uh, so we used to say compost and chips and mulch. And one is one and one is the other. Uh, now over the time what's come on the market is quote living mulch, which is a combination of compost and mulch uh, chips. Uh, I like this even more and now that I've gotten older. Uh, it's a one time application and you can uh, have a little bit of compost and, uh, and, and the mulch. So that's what I would do. I would mix the two. So, uh, Worm cast, castings are considered uh, a, a compost of type, so you would mix that with the organic mulch or the, 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 the wood chips, and then that would be applied to uh, beds and around trees. Perfect. Uh, and back to the orange oil, someone is wondering, is this the same as an essential oil or where can you get the orange oil? The orange oil is now readily available at most nurseries uh, or at home and ranch stores or farm and ranch stores rather, I'm sorry, uh, farm and ranch stores, uh, there's a couple around town, uh, but most of the larger nurseries will have that. Some of the Home Depots have it. Uh, I, I've seen it also at Lowe's, but you may have to look or ask for it, but there are many of the nurseries that specialize in organic practices that have both on the shelves, both the orange oil and the vinegar. And, and again, several, it's strong, strong vinegar. Yeah, we've had several people commenting in the Q&A and in the chat that they have found it at a number of, of the local nurseries that your rewards coupons will be good at. And mm -hmm. when you take the survey at the end of this, today um, or for any of the other spring bloom webinars if you win one of our prizes um, for participating this week you the coupons will be good same nurseries so yes and so they may say on some of the prizes it may say not to use for pesticides or fertilizers that will be the exception i will uh, authorize that the orange oil and vinegar will be acceptable to be used for the uh, uh, the uh, coupon prices. Okay, and still along with that same thought, the orange oil vinegar mix, um, we know we talked about worms and, and other large organisms, but what about microorganisms in the soil, like mycorrhizome? And so, uh, orange oil on its own is an insecticide. It's a very effective insecticide. We, we mix it either uh, uh, one part orange oil, two parts, a water or something similar and it's very effective. So it can be detrimental at higher amounts, but at two ounces per vinegar, per one gallon of vinegar, uh, it's, it's not gonna be that detrimental to microorganisms. So we worry about that. That's absolutely true. Uh, people don't worry about what the life in the soil and that is probably the most important part of any landscape is what's happening in the soil uh, as opposed to what's being applied above ground so we do worry about that but at that amount it's probably not going to be a problem uh, but, the other thing uh, i added to, would like to add to that is that you're 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 getting the grass wet you are not saturating it to the to the level where it's going to soak in the soil you don't want to do that you want that your herbicide to go as far as it can. And so you're really saturating those blades, not the soil. That's a good way to put it. Excellent. Okay, and another question here, what if you're removing weeds, but not so much grass to plant a native bed? Is there a different process to accomplishing this? So my answer for that is that the, it will work the same if you're cooking and covering and killing grass, you can cook and cover and kill weeds. The only caveat to that is I want you to think about the ones that you're taking out. Because if you're planting other native and drought tolerant plants, 
Well, they can coexist pretty well with straggler daisy, or as Mark calls it, horse herb, and some other ones that henbit that, that bloom and do really good things for the bees and other wildlife. And they add to your, your attractive new landscaping. I mean, so straggler daisy has a pretty little yellow flower and henbit has a little purple flower. And they, they could just coexist with the plants that you're doing. If there's other ones that are really taking over, and I understand that, yes, you could do the same mechanism. Any of the same mechanisms would work, whether it's, you know, the herbicide or the covering or digging. Great. And on a different note, someone is asking, is it okay to put burned paper ash into your compost? Um, ash is, has a very high pH, uh, and so I don't know if you'd want to do that. But if you're mixing coffee grounds and ash, eh, not a problem. Uh, but you always always have to remember what what, what are you putting into your compost pile. We always like to use the green and brown. Layers of green and brown. So uh, green would be glass grass clippings or leaves and brown would be like paper. Uh, so uh, preferably not burned. Balance. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I, I'll tell you what, I never heard this question before. So I'm a little, you know, little <laughs> <laughs> little thought about I had to think about this for a minute. Uh, yeah, I, just, I wouldn't that, put ash into whether it was from burned wood or burned paper. It's yeah. still the same. I wouldn't. It's it's, I would it's highly uh, alkaline. Um, so I would I wouldn't do it. I would I think it would mess up everything. All the fungi. Okay, well, that was it a took lot me of... back a little bit. I had to stop and think about this. That was a lot of really great questions. Um, I think we've gotten through them all. So thank you, Seth, for fielding all of those. And thank you everyone who joined us today and Gail and Mark for telling us about how to kill grass <laughs> in so many different methods. Um, we hope that everyone will tune in later today for Karen Guz's presentation on toddler plants and their weed foes at 11 a.m. and a Q&A hour from 12 to 1 on plants and the big freeze. So check out GardenStyleSA.com. You'll find more links on there for those presentations. If you haven't signed up yet, you can go there and just join them at those times. Um, and if more questions come up later, feel free to go back to GardenStyleSA.com. It's a great resource for you. And you can also ask our Garden Geek any questions you may have. And again, don't forget to take your survey um, from today's presentation to get your rewards points. And if you have not signed up to be a rewards member, but you've attended stuff over the last couple of days, sign up by the end of today. So do it. When right would that after, be, Martha? Do it right after this presentation. <laughs> you don't forget. Um, sign up by the end of today to be a become yeah. a rewards member. Um, and the survey link is on Garden Style San Antonio. You can find it there. The easiest path to get there, Mark has it on here, saws.org slash spring bloom will redirect you right to the spring bloom specific website that has all the details with the survey links and everything. So please visit that and thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Martha. Thank you, Seth. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, everybody. Mark.